Our sermon today is from John chapter 15. And the structure of this chapter and of the message is with these five words, abide, obey, love, hate, and help. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you that we can abide in you. We ask that you bless us with the, with the life-giving words of Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' incredible name. Amen. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 15, we'll be reading this chapter together. I'm reading through for the, with the English Standard Version. And it begins like this. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does, does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Uh, we'll pause right there. The word abide, Jesus uses over and over again. And other, other versions use uh, other words like um, stay in or uh, continue in, uh, stay connected, those types of things. To me, it necessitates that it's not just a, a brief brushing up against Jesus, uh, just hey, just checking in, you know, kind of a relationship. It's something that's ongoing. It's something that's lasting. It's enduring. And to abide in Jesus, like a branch would abide in the vine, means that it's consistently connected to it. And in fact, that connection is life-giving to that branch. And by, through that, that abiding, the branch then can produce fruit. And Jesus kind of makes the, the, the observation that no branch can bear fruit by itself. It has to stay connected to the vine. So you also need to stay connected to me. And then you'll bear much fruit, which brings God the Father uh, glory. You know, to c expand on this illustration that Jesus uses here of a vine, maybe you and I, uh, unless we have some sort of agricultural background or we happen to have some vines growing in our, in our garden growing up or presently, we might not have as much connection to vines. So for the sake of this ser series, and for the sake of this illustration, I'm going to expand it to, to plants in general. How do you view yourself? Maybe you uh, have some sort of heart connection to herbs of all kinds. Or maybe you see yourself more like a flowering plant. Or um, maybe as a vine. Or maybe like a tree, which is depicted behind me. And now, uh, plants in general, they have different seasons that they go through and like this tree i really love this this painting don't you of this tree that that moves from flowering to a season of fruit and then it moves into uh, a season of fall 
where things change in its, in its existence and then it moves into this time of freezing. So flower, fruit, fall and freezing. Do you like all the, the alliteration? Now, trees go through this, plants go through this and in order to endure to the next season, to endure through this time of fall and freezing, it has to uh, be persistent and it really has to do with what is it rooted in. So Jesus is saying, well, you're a branch, <laughs> I'm the vine, be, be connected, abide in me. And this illustration of these plants, it, it shows us that there is this um, aim, there is this goal to bear this fruit. Now. We might think that this fruit bearing has to do with being productive. And I think it does. I think it has to do with being productive as children of God and not being lazy. But I think that it also has another connection because of what comes after this. He, he continues on. And I'm going to begin again in verse 9 now. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask your fa the Father in my name, he will give it to you. These things I command you so that you love one another. There's a lot there and let's look a little deeper. This this whole section begins actually in chapter 13 because Jesus didn't just begin in, ver in chapter, verse 1 of chapter 15 and he didn't begin in chapter 14. He began right after washing the disciples' feet and they had just gotten up from the feast. They were headed off towards Gethsemane and in John chapter 13, verse 34, and Jesus, he says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. I'm going to read it again. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. For him to choose this time to speak to them, is it shows the importance that Jesus is placing on this command, that we are to love one another. And I see that love, you know, it's more than just this ideal. Love, love is a feeling that we get and it is the ideal that we should have. But Jesus, in the way that he explains love, there isn't another option. And the way Jesus lived, he lived perfectly in love. Every situation from the good and the bad, the, the beautiful and the difficult, uh, and the tragic even at, on the cross, he loves. He loves perfectly. He loves completely. And there's no other option for him. And he's saying, love each other. And he's talking more than just a feeling, just a, a, a washing over of, oh, I, I feel so much love for you right now. You know, heart emoji, you know, the, loving each other is something that is enduring. It's something that like abiding a branch 
is abiding in the vine. Can you imagine uh, considering that love, uh, this type of deep connection of re recognizing that you're connected, that there's something that you exist in and you endure in even when the, in the hard times. Then to look at yourself and to say, how can I love more? How can I love not just more in quantity or frequency, but how can I love as my only option? What areas of my life am I not loving in? Uh, wh what areas of my life am I making exceptions in, in the way that I love? The ultimate commandment is to love, to love God and love each other. And that sums up all, all of the law. So we can look at the law, we can look at the commandments and say, how does love sum these up? Well, if I love God completely, then I'm going to put him first. I'm not going to have other gods before him. And I'm not, and I'm going to uh, honor the, the name that I'm taking on myself. And I'm going to, re to keep that date I have with him every week on his day, on, on the Sabbath. Um, I'll remember that day. I'm not going to forget it. So that's, that's how I can honor God. But then to, to love each other, well, how do I love the other people in my life? How do I love my parents? I show them honor. I show them honor to their face and I show them honor when I speak about them to the people around me. Uh, I don't, I don't, um, what's that number five, number six? I don't kill, I don't steal, I don't commit adultery, I keep my, my, the word, the promises that I've made to my spouse. I give myself completely into that relationship that I'm not holding some part back or giving some part to somebody else. When I look at my neighbor, I'm honoring them because I'm not trying to kill them because that wouldn't be loving. I'm not trying to take away something that gives them life. I'm not trying to take anything that belongs to them. And I'm not even wanting to want it, which would be coveting. And to acknowledge that that loving is my only option it's the only way that's been exemplified through Christ. That's hard. That's a very high standard. And the reality is, is that uh, none of us have done it. We are selfish. We have broken, we have made compromises in our, the way that we love each other. And Jesus, in the, this crucial time, understanding completely everything that's in front of them, knowing that they are going to uh, endure incredible persecution and trial and self-doubt and doubt in, in him, um, confusion, and, and then joy to follow his example and to go into all the world, to bring all people into a knowledge of who he is. They are going to need to love. And so he tells them, love one another and people will know that you are following me because you love one another and and that's the the focus this is the hyper focus of of jesus it is the fixation point of john and john in fact continues this one point of loving each other into his first second and third letters to the churches and then also into the book of Revelation and we'll be going into those other writings of John in the fall as we enter into the the winter so that it'll be a special thing that we get to explore together and you might not think that the book of Revelation is about love it is about love just as a tree that hasn't reached its max height according to its uh, DNA, the sky is the limit. That it has the, the space, it has the nourishment from the sun, it has carbon dioxide to breathe in and, and the oxygen to put out, it has, it has space, it is able to grow. Just as it's able to grow up, it can also continue to grow down into its roots, deeper into the earth through what sometimes can be uh, pretty bad soil. It can go down deep to where there's uh, flowing waters of, 
uh, that will nourishment and keep it alive even in a time of difficulty. The same goes for us that when we are abiding in God, when we are abiding in His love, the sky is the limit to how we can continue to improve on that love because there is no limit to how much love God can be pouring into us or how much foundation, how firm our grasp can be on His Word and in the knowledge of who He is, that it can flow through our soul and revive us, even when the times are, are um, arid or, or freezing. We can endure through the difficult things that are ahead of us because we abide in Jesus, to abide in His love. You know, sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that somehow we can do one without the other. That somehow we can love God and be in relationship with Him without being in relationship to the others around us that are also abiding in Christ. We see from plants that no branch stands alone, that they all are connected to the, to the vine or to the trunk, but they are connected to each other and that they, they must recognize that together they are in relationship and that that relationship to each other is vital to their survival. It is crucial for them to be in connection to each other. Jesus understood this. Why don't we? That we are to love one another. And this is, this is the characteristic that uh, in John 13, Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples because you love one another. To love each other, to have that same love that's flowing into us, flow out to the people around us, it proves our identity and connection to God, and it helps us endure. Jesus continues. He says all of these important points about love, he, these encouragements, that we love each other. Then in verse 18, he, he goes straight into what is ahead of them. And he says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But you are not of the world. But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates also my father. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. And we'll pause there. Save the last two verses. Jesus explains that because you love, the world will hate you. I think some people feel the heat from the world or heat from somewhere and they think, oh, this is the persecution that Jesus talked about. But I don't see them being hated because they love. <laughs> I see them being hated because uh, of many other things. Uh, stubbornness, pride, um, hatred themselves. Um, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, when you love, when you love, they will hate you because I loved and they hated me. You are my servant. You're my friends. So they will hate you because you love. This is his commandment. And when we follow his commandments, the world rejects us. How are we rejected because of the way we love? Chapter 15 wraps up with these words of Jesus in verse 26 and 27. But Jesus just mentions all of the trials that are going to happen. He says, but 
when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Help. Ah, oh, help. We need help. You know, when reading this chapter <laughs> for this sermon, and also for myself, but I think mostly for this sermon this week, I had to pause. When I got to verse 9, this, uh, this verse in the middle of all of this, and I had read through it a few times, and then to suddenly my attention was gra grabbed on to verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Abide in my love. And it was almost as though Jesus, Jesus' words were to me, abide, abide in my love, abide in my love. Brandon Stoltz, who has run around for the past couple weeks like a branch disconnected from the vine, trying to bear fruit on its own, going to be, going to end up shriveled and dried up, worth nothing. I think productivity is not the fruit <laughs> that Jesus is expecting. Yes, I, I think that productivity will happen, but I think the fruit is that we love, that we love God and we love each other, that we spend our, I would like to say time, but I think that it's different. That we spend, do you, do you play conversations in your head? Do you replay conversations or anticipate conversations uh, with certain people <laughs> in your life? Uh, maybe the conversations feel more like, uh, you know, man, I should have said this instead. Ah, that would have really gotten him. That would have been perfect. If we were to spend our time and energy not, so, not in uh, trying to figure out how we could one-up somebody, or how we could set somebody and put somebody in their place. Instead, to wonder, how could I have loved? Not just said something with love. <laughs> There's a difference. But to love. How could I have loved that person? That kind of preoccupation bears fruit. Good fruit. To be in conflict with someone and then to, to ask yourself, how can I love? Not, not can I love? Because according to Jesus, according to his commandment, there is no other option. How can I love in that situation that happened, that might happen in the future? And how can I make what happened how can I write what happened by loving? Loving in Jesus' mind, again, is not some sort of warm feeling, isn't just a pleasant platitude that we hand out to people as we walk around. This is not, this is not how can I be nice? This is how can I love? And you might say, well, it's tough love. How can we love? In looking at how John, his grip on this idea of loving, the way he sees love and the way that he depicts, uh, spoiler alert, in Revelation, the kind of sin, condemnable sin, are the acts that are done without repentance, that we feel vindicated in, but they are not they are not loving. They are condemning. They are without redemption uh, towards the people around us. And so in, in the same way, God, without, without redemption, uh, pours out those plagues on the people that, that gave them. This is a much deeper 
abiding understanding of love that John has than I have uh, heard people talk about or seen people demonstrate. But I do see it in the way that Jesus lives. And the way that we love, the way we think we're loving, is often too harsh. It, it has a harshness to it that is unloving. There is a selfish element twisted in there. There is a, uh, I'm going to get even or get better than that other person. And to ask God to look at the life of Jesus in his word and to say, how can I abide in that? How can I abide in his love? One, gives me confidence in tomorrow that I can trust him. But two, that I can love that no matter what happens in my connection to the people around me, I will be able to love that person. That is difficult. That is hard. And that's what we're continuing to investigate. This is, this is almost halfway through the, the chapters that John records of Jesus' discussion with his disciples. And for me, I have been trying to endure. I've been trying to get through these, these latter difficulties, this time especially, and whatever is approaching ahead. And I have seen far too many of our friends and family and uh, people in our community choose to disconnect themselves, maybe not from God, but not understand that loving each other is what gets us through. And I think that we have some hard stuff coming still. And we need to abide in Christ right alongside each other to press together, to press together. That is an, that is a, an essential part of being a church community and to be by ourselves will have effects on our ability to endure through the, the fall and freezing times of our life. Because I, I believe that that time of first flower, <laughs> I'm going to keep working the illustration, that time of, of first flower is coming very soon, I think very soon, because he said it. I think that time of refreshing, that time of renewal, that time of redemption, for us individually and for our community is approaching and that we can trust that Jesus has us but that his commandments are also essential to love him and to love each other and this will bear fruit and I have seen even in this time of freezing, this time of quarantine, this time of distance, fruit. Fruit in our church, in our lives individually, it's been hard. But he's doing stuff. If you have not, if you have not yet hunkered down with this book of John. <laughs> Pick up a copy. Download the app or listen to it on audio and spend time in these words because it would have been very easy for me, even as a pastor, even as preparing this message, to just breeze right on through that verse and to set this book down and be like, all right, I'm done. What's next to do? And I would have missed out. I would have missed out on that, uh, that reminder to abide, that the endurance that is offered to me through the words of Jesus. And I, I'm scared to think that 
if I wasn't preaching from this chapter this week, I would have just continued on in my my disconnected branchism and I would have found myself in a week or two uh, or maybe sooner in a state of withered dryness good for nothing. What about you? I'd like to pray for us. <laughs> Will you pray with me as I pray for for you and for our community? Our good God, our Heavenly Father, that is glorified in our loving each other. May we learn to love more completely. Lord, there's a lot of stuff we've been going through. There's a lot of hard stuff, a lot of confusing things. Thank you for making love the solution to abide in your love, to obey your commandment, to love you and to love each other completely. And you've shown us how, you've told us how, and now it's for us to do it. Help us to cling to you, to abide in you so we can endure and we can bloom and we can bear fruit. I ask these things in the trustworthy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.